Please open your Bibles then, if you will, to the book of 2 Kings chapter 9. Again. <laughs> 2 Kings chapter 9 for this evening. Here's the title I came up with for this chapter. I'm calling it Cleaning House. And uh, that's a very, I want you to take that in a very ominous way because this is a difficult <coughs> chapter. As a matter of fact, uh, we've been away a little bit from the book of 2 Kings. I was gone that one week to the conference, and then uh, last week uh, we were in John chapter 6. And uh, <laughs> let me be absolutely honest with you. Last week, one of the reasons why we ended up in John chapter 6 is because, honestly, your pastor needed more time to digest 2 Kings chapter 9. It's a difficult chapter. It's a hard chapter to read. It's a difficult chapter to, in some respects, to comprehend. And I honestly needed a couple of weeks just to let it filter in. Let me give you a quote that I found by commentator Morgan. Here's what he said about this chapter. It is indeed a terrible chapter in which the truth of the divine government is written no longer in gentle words of patient mercy, but in flames of fire. I think it's important for us in one respect to begin to gain an appreciation of the fact that the Bible is an accurate historical record. It is a record of God's people, but it is a record of people, of fallen people. And even though they're God's people and God continues to work with them, I think that none of us have gone through the scriptures without being surprised on a number of occasions at how God's people will act, or ourselves for that matter. It is in every way true. It gives us insight, and sometimes very sad insight, into what can and what will happen if God's people leave him. This is serious. And even when the word, or maybe I should say perhaps particularly when the word of God speaks of judgment, we should pay all the more serious attention. Now, not in a fearful way, because if you're the Lord's, I want you to know that he will work all things together for the good, to those who love him, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Now, through these studies in 2 Kings and 1 Kings, well, actually, since the very start of the Bible, I would say, we have been told exactly what will happen to these people. Back and forth, we've been told, here's what will happen if they obey the blessings. And here's what will happen if they disobey, and they are given strict, very strict <laughs> Guidelines. They are given very strict instructions. They are told exactly what God will do in the area of curses if they do not follow God. We're at a point here in the scriptures where we are told very specifically. I don't know if you've ever had the thought of somebody coming up to you and say, Thus says the Lord, and reads your mail of everything you've done wrong, and then tells you what God intends to do to you on account of it. But these people have had that. And it may shock us in the here and now to see God's judgment on the earth. But I want to tell you something. This is what the Lord told me. That's nothing in comparison to the judgment of God in all of eternity. You got that one? So really we're just getting some little snapshot here. If we see judgment in the here and now, eternity is eternal. And God's judgment there is eternal. So let's pray, and then let's take a look into 2 Kings chapter 9. Father, it's in Jesus' name that we're before you and before your word. Lord, we don't want to be fearful. <laughs> uh, we don't want to be shocked or grossed out in any way, but at the same time, Lord God, we want to be serious, and we want to take a serious look at this. Uh, Lord, speak to our hearts. Let it reveal to us more of who you are and more of what it is that you've called your people to do and to be in this world. We love you, Lord. We thank you for your word. I thank you for your word, Father. In Jesus' wonderful name, and everybody says, Amen. 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 
2 uh, Kings chapter 9, verse 1. Here we go. And Elisha, the prophet, called one of the sons of the prophets. That would be one of his schools of ministry that he had. And he said to him, Get yourself ready. Take this flask of oil in your hand and go to Ramoth Gilead. So here in the start of this chapter, we see that the prophet Elisha has a job for one of his students to do. And in order to complete this job, he's going to be needing a flask of oil to get the job done. Some of you may be guessing, flask of oil, hmm, sounds like maybe some kind of anointing will take place while well, you're right. But let me give you a broad scope real quick of these next couple of chapters, at, 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 you know, at least the next couple of chapters. The various kings have, who have held office in particular in the north of Israel have been leading God's people steadily away from God and more and more into evil, serving false gods and evil practices, some of them uh, sacrificing their children, uh, tremendous evil in uh, uh, sexual habits. Uh, and it has gone so far that the Lord is going to put the brakes on it. It has gone so far that God says, I must now bring some judgment. God is literally going to clean house here. So the current kings must go. Their lineage must go. And their false gods must go. So we have a flask of oil with this young man. Verse 2. Now when you arrive at the place, look there for Jehu. Pay attention to that name. That's important. Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat. This is not Jehoshaphat of the south in Judah who was a king. This is a different Jehoshaphat. So it wants to identify him. Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi. And go in and make him rise up from among his associates. It's interesting that uh, Elisha knows he'll be sitting with his associates when you get there. And take him into an inner room. So what he's telling him, what I'm asking you to do must be very private. Verse 3, then take the flask of oil, pour it on his head, and say, Thus says the Lord, I have anointed you king over Israel. Then open the door and flee. <laughs> and do not delay. So you have, already have it in your mind. It's kind of a funny picture going on. Jehu's a commander uh, of one of uh, uh, one of the commanders in the north, and, and he's a great leader, and uh, he's also very tough in combat. So this is a uh, this is a soldier through and through. Uh, this Jehu then is going to be the replacement king for the north. He's going to be the king that God uses to get rid of the bad leaders to stop the idolatry and get rid of the false gods. And look, again, and I'll repeat this a number of times, it's not that these leaders have not been warned. Several times, and prophecies have been given to their destruction, yet there's no repentance. And they just keep getting further away. They want to ignore the word of God. Look, you know, I, I, I don't see much difference between this and... The United States of America. Yeah. You've got pastors all over the country, you know, using their pulpits to say, America, repent. Look, we were started as a Christian nation. We've got to knock this off. Quit being politically correct. Please, please don't worry about what other people think. Please worry about what God thinks. And politicians just shine it on so that they can get elected again, so that they can have their place in position. I don't see any difference between the warnings here, you know, there, and the warnings here. A replacement king, of course, would not be happy news to the current king, and that's why I think that this is done in secret. That is why Elisha did not come and do the job himself, because Elisha would have brought a whole lot of attention, wouldn't he? Everybody would have known what is up. Here's uh, one, another commentator, Dilday. Here's what he has to say. Elisha's insistence that the anointing ceremony be secret 
would allow the new king, that's Jehu, to choose the right time to raise the standard of his revolution without alerting Jehoram, the current king in the north. The surprise would prevent the king from making preparation to oppose it, which is exactly what we're going to see. Uh, you know, by the way, I, I, you know, look, maybe just because I'm a man, but there's a part of me I would love to go see this at the movie theaters. I'd love to see it in 3D. I'd love to see it right on the IMAX screen, you know? This is how it happened. This is how God's judgment works, you know? Verse 4, So the young man, the servant of the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead. And when he arrived, there were the captains of the army sitting, just as Elisha had said. And he says, I have a commander, I have a message for you, commander, Jehu said. Jehu, remember, he's the one that we're talking about. He responds, For which one of us? And he said, For you, commander. Then he arose and went into the house. And he poured the oil on his head and said to him, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed you king over the people of the Lord over Israel. <laughs> that probably would have been a shock to him, don't you think? I mean, an absolute shock. Uh, now, let me show you what struck me in this. And I, I actually kind of like it. Look at the very end of verse 6. Now, what God says, I have anointed you king over who? The people of the Lord. Look, even in the face of their gross idolatry and rejecting God, even though God took them out of slavery in Egypt, brought them into this promised land, have given them absolutely everything, God does not stop here in saying, these are my people. This is the people of the Lord. Does that like give you some comfort for your own life? Amen. That God continues to call you his own? You know, I like to think of Jacob, don't you? Old heel catcher. Listen, God still calls him the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob. I mean, that's, that is pretty magnanimous of God. That shows God's <laughs> grace. But I look at that and I think God's still calling these people his people. But I will tell you, this must be a heartbreaking event for God. I don't, he doesn't want this to happen. He never wanted this to take place. Look, I know that there's, uh, I know there's some of us and every now and then I'll get a phone call or I'll counsel somebody in this situation where they know God, have served God, and then they run away from God and then God takes everything away from them. Anybody ever heard that? Everybody ever done that, been there, lived that, that kind of thing? Okay. They go to that place where God absolutely removes everything. He cleans house. And then he begins to put the person back together again. Why does God do it like that? So that that person will forever know that every single thing they have of blessings has come from God. Amen. There is no way that that person can ever deny, since God took them to zero and could have left them there, that he still claimed them as his own, even though he had stripped them away of everything. And then as he rebuilds them, the person has to say, it was all God. All God. Everything I have is from God. My life, my home, my marriage, my children, my breath, my church family, my ministry, anything that I could possibly do now, I give it all to God and I recognize that it is God who has done it. All right, the anointing continues. Picture that this hardened soldier sitting down, this young kid just poured a flask of oil over the top of his head. You're going to be king over God's people. Verse 7, you shall strike down the house of Ahab, your master. Actually, we know that Ahab's already dead right now, don't we? But his son is ruling in the north. You will strike down the house of, of Ahab, your master, that I may avenge my blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. I got to stop you right now, and I got to tell you, there's going to be a bit of a repeat of this in a certain sense. When we get to the book of Revelation, when we get to the end of the age, which can't be that far away, how many of you have heard that there are... Uh, uh, 
couple of ships of Russian soldiers uh, have just pulled into Syria. Anybody? Yeah. Heard that's pretty serious, isn't it? Uh, news reports say this is the most uh, Russian soldiers that have ever been deployed in Syria. And guess what city they've been deployed to? Damascus. <laughs> and uh, there's a prophecy of brewing about Damascus, isn't there? And what does it say about Damascus? It says that God's going to destroy it and nobody will ever live there again. Damascus is one of the oldest cities that has ever been inhabited. It's got a track record of consistent habitation for about 10 or 12,000 years. They think people have always lived in Damascus. That's going to end. We also know that Russia's going to come down because they're going to get after Israel or want what Israel has, and they're going to come through Syria, and God says he's going to stop them cold and wipe out five-sixths of their armies. It's going to happen. Absolutely. It's going to look a little bit like what just happened this week with them dropping down in there. Interesting to say, and what we'll, what we'll see in the book of Revelation, I got sidetracked there for a moment, is that uh, in heaven, uh, it says that there'll be a bunch of martyrs that are under God's uh, throne. Are you familiar with this? Mm -hmm. A bunch of martyrs that are under God's throne in heaven. And what do they say? How long? How long, O Lord, till you avenge our blood? How long? See, there's, there's something, I want to get to this before we get to the end, but there's something that people continually mistake about God. And the mistake that people continually make about God is they mistake his long suffering and his holding back action, that's his mercy, they mistake that with God just allowing things or saying that it's okay. Christians, you, you, you need to know this. We need to comprehend this. That there's absolutely no sin that will go unpaid for. From the smallest little infraction to the greatest, grandest thing you could ever think of. There will be no sin in this universe that will not be paid for. That's salvation then and how it works. You either pay for your own sins or they were paid for you on the cross of Calvary by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. We're right in the middle of this prophecy. This Ahab's descendants wiped out for the servant's blood at the hand of Jezebel. Uh, do you remember Jezebel? It's crazy. She's still alive and kicking up. <laughs> you know, secular writings tell us that Jezebel was really beautiful. She was stunning, you know. That's the story about Jezebel. She was very beautiful. Um, but she was also very wicked, very cruel. And she used to hunt down and kill prophets. You all remember this, don't you? Yeah. And she used to kill the priests. And she came up with her own priests, kind of a black magic kind of priests. She was very wicked. And this was already told... It, all that I'm saying here and all that God is saying, it's already been told them that it's going to happen. But, but they just kept right on going. Amazing. Verse 8. Uh, For the whole house of Ahab shall perish. The whole house means all of the descendants. And I will cut off from Ahab all of the males in Israel, both bond and free. So I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam the son of Nebat. And if you remember, we went through that. He and all his descendants were judged. And like the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah, same thing. The dog sh shall eat Jezebel on the plot of ground at Jezreel. There shall be none to bury her. Okay, this is quoting directly from Elijah and the prophecy that he said would happen. Uh, he opened the door and fled. <laughs> so I imagine this whole scene on his behalf was just breathless, you know. He's like, I can't believe I'm saying this. And, and, you know, it's just like Elisha said. There he sits, pours the oil, blah, 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 you know, you shall. And then he just jams out of there as fast as he can go, you know. Uh, so again, as, uh, you know, all right, let's just go. Uh, he fled. Verse 11. Then Jehu came out 
to the servants of his master, which would have been the other commanders basically at his same level. And one said to him, is all well? Why did this madman come to you? I mean, they just saw him, you know, dash it out the door. And then they see, they see Jehu come to the door. And what does he look like? <laughs> he, he's dripping oil. And he's got probably this look on his face like, what just happened, you know? And he said to them, uh, you know the man and his babble. So the servant comes running. Jehu comes out dripping with oil. And uh, he sees his friends and he kind of blows it off at the start. Jehu doesn't seem to know what has just hit him, not just yet. In my thinking, it takes a moment for the oil to seep in. <laughs> Verse 12, and they said, a lie? You know, like, did he tell us a lie? Tell us now, you know, what's going on? So he said, uh, thus and thus and spoke to me saying, thus says the Lord, I have anointed you king over Israel. Okay, I think that there's a super pregnant pause there be, between right when he finishes that statement. There's like this there's like this revelation that hits him right here I think at this spot and not only him alone but all the other commanders. So he goes, well, that guy was a madman. He said I'm going to be king over all of Israel. And then there's a quiet, and I think as of the Spirit of the Lord, I think they all get it. Look at verse 13. Then each man hastened to take his garment and put it under him on the top of the steps. In other words, they're throwing their coats down before him for him to walk on. And they blew the trumpet saying, Jehu is king. Perhaps they thought of their current king, Joram. They don't like him, apparently. They have no love for him. And when they spread out their garments for Jehu to walk upon, that was a sign of honor. That was a sign of loyalty. They were saying, we're with you. We pledge allegiance to you and not to our current king. And at that point, the proverbial snowball is rolling down the hill. Jehu will reign for 28 years. Strong king, army commander, strong leader, loyal followers. But you can guess what happens next. He's going to take every single word of that prophecy literally. Of what God said. Verse 14, so Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, conspired against Joram. In other words, he says, all right, guys, what are we going to do here? And Joram is a descendant of Ahab. That's his son. Now, Joram had been defending Ramath Gilead, he and all of Israel, against Haziel, king of Syria. Uh, Joram uh, got into a fight with the Syrians, and then he got wounded in battle. And so he's at Jezreel laid up. That's what's going on. So he's not with these commanders here. But King Joram had returned to Jezreel, that's what it's saying, to recover from the wounds which the Syrians had, I should have just read this verse, huh? had inflicted on him when he fought with Haziel, king of Syria. And Jehu said, if you are so minded to the other commanders, you guys are really in on this, let no one leave or escape from the city and go and tell it to Jezreel. So they lock down the whole city where they're at. Nobody can get out. Nobody can share a peep. Where the king is, is about 45 miles away. That's what's happening. So Jehu is going after the family of Ahab, and he's going to be shrewd, and he's going to be swift about it. Verse 16, so Jehu rode in a chariot and went to Jezreel, for Joram had laid up there, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, well, he's going to get two kings for the price of one. Not only do you have the northern king there in Jezreel, 
but you also have the southern king of Judah, Ahaziah. Ahaziah has no business making friends, even though he's related now by marriage. He has no business really and hasn't had any business making friends with the northern wicked king. Uh, so he had come down to see him, to see Joram. How you doing? So they're both there. All right, that's the picture. <laughs> they're in Jezreel. And here comes uh, uh, Jehu. Here comes Jehu, and he is in his chariot. Oh, isn't this exciting? Wouldn't you like to see this Spielberg movie? Come on. <laughs> Verse 17, now the watchman stood at the tower of Jezreel. So there's the guy at the watch for 45 miles. That's a, you know, that's tough. There was no 405 freeway. Of course, it would probably take longer on the 405 freeway. <laughs> <laughs> so he's up in the tower of Jezreel, and he saw a company of Jehu as he came, and he said, what's in the distance? I see a company of men. And Joram, that's the king who's laid up, said, get a horseman and send him to meet them and let him say, is it peace? <laughs> now, uh, here's another thing that stood out to me. It's interesting that you're going to see right in a row in the next just handful of verses, the word peace is going to be mentioned eight times in a row. And I think that's very interesting, the word peace. I think a lot of people want peace, don't they? Mm -hmm. But I don't know if they know the definition of peace, and I'll give that to you in a moment. But he goes, is it peace or not? Verse 18, so the horsemen went to meet him and said, thus says the king, is it peace? And Jehu in his chariot said, what have you to do with peace? Cool. Turn around and follow me. Boy. Talk about a recruiting job. <coughs> he recruits this guy, and this guy jumps in line behind him. So the watchman reported, say, hey, the messenger went to them, but is not coming back. This is weird. <laughs> then he sent out a second horseman who came to them and said, thus says the king, is it peace? And Jehu answered, what have you to do with peace? Turn around and follow me. So the watchman reported, saying, he went up to them and is not coming back. <laughs> you know, it's like, what was your first indication that things were not good? And the driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshi, for he drives furiously. So apparently, when Jehu went into battle, he had the reputation of racing into battle and of taking no prisoners. He was what you call a hard charger. So Jehu is just this madman on a chariot, you know. Yeah, yeah, he just going. The guy looks at him and he goes, man, the guy's coming like, charging like Jehu. So from now on, when you're out on the road, <laughs> somebody comes racing by you, you can say, that guy's driving like Jehu. <laughs> Why do you say <laughs> in a charger. Oh. <laughs> Verse 21. So Joram, that's the king, said, stupidly, sorry, I just added that. Make ready. And his chariot was made ready. Then Joram, the king of Israel, and Ahaziah, the king of Judah, went out. What are you guys, nuts? <laughs> each in his chariot. And they went out to meet Jehu. And they met him on the property. Mm -hmm. This is important. The Holy Spirit's put this in. Bible students, take note. You should know this by now. They met him on the property of Naboth the Jezreelite. What property is that? Remember one day Ahab was going, whoa, just... Life's just so boring, but you know what? I look at that beautiful piece of property over there that uh, Naboth has. He's got this beautiful garden, and I want that garden, but I can't have that garden. So what, what did Jezebel do? That's right. She killed Naboth and all of Naboth's descendants, and she took the land. And that, to God, 
was the straw that broke the camel's back. Let's just look at this for one moment because I think this is exciting. Yeah. The straw that broke the camel's back was land that did not belong to somebody else in the promised land being given to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Stolen, misappropriated land that God apportioned specifically to somebody, Naboth and his descendants, forever was taken away and given illegally to somebody else. Come on, does this sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Even our own presidents are messing this thing up. Mm -hmm. And they keep telling the Jews to give away land. Mm -hmm. And that's the straw that broke the camel's back here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if it was your land, you could give it away. Anybody? <laughs> but God says, it's their land. I've given it to them. So anybody's argument with giving away land of Israel is an argument not with men, but it's an argument with God. And that's not going to fly. Where are we? <laughs> uh, 21. 21. Then Joram said, oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Right. Good. Okay. They end up on the piece of land that, uh, that uh, uh, Jezebel said to kill that guy on. Now it happened when Joram saw Jehu that he said, is it peace, Jehu? <laughs> <laughs> so he answered, what peace? As long as the harlotries of your mother Jezebel and her witchcraft are so many. <laughs> Yeah, I would take that as a no, exactly right. You know? But you're not supposed to talk about somebody's mama. Especially to the king. The look on his face was in Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh, you're right. That king would have been shocked, but I think the very next reaction would have, I think he'd have seen the blood just drain out of his face. Now, let me give you the definition of peace. You ready? Peace is actually the ruling of righteousness and not necessarily the absence of hostility. That works for a Christian. Let me give you that definition again. Peace is actually the ruling of righteousness and not necessarily the absence of hostility. Even in your own being, Christian, when you give your life to Christ in order to have peace, you have to have Christ ruling in your heart. Amen. Where does the spiritual battle happen? When I want my will instead of God's ruling righteousness in my life, then the spiritual battle is on. So we say no Christ, no peace, no Christ, no, no peace. <laughs> K-N-O-W. No peace. Hey, the idea is, though, that it, it doesn't mean, you know, it's going to be sweet dreams and daisies every day unless I give over the ruling of my heart and life completely to the righteous rule of God. Then I've got peace. Verse 23, then Joram turned around and fled. <laughs> so he does a 180 on his chariot. And while he's whizzing by Ahaziah... <laughs> He shouts, treachery, Ahaziah! <laughs> so Ahaziah beats it too. Now Jehu drew his bow with full strength and shot Jehoram. Now Jehoram and Joram are the same guy. Joram is like his nickname in the Bible, but his, his full name is Jehoram. He shot him between his arms, and the arrow came out his heart. And he sank in his chariot. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine exactly just the, and he pulled it back with full strength and just, man, let that fly. Now look, I'll tell you, he may have been a good shot. But let's be absolutely honest here. Mm -hmm. That arrow hit its target because God let it hit its yep. target. Mm -hmm. Now Jehu drew that bow, let it fly, boom, he sinks down. Verse 25, then Jehu said to Bidkar, his captain, he, they were just the day, 
Earlier that day, they were equals. Now he's the king, and here's one of his captains now. Pick him up and throw him into the tract of the field of Naboth the Jezreelite. For remember, look, e even this guy is remembering. When you and I were riding together behind Ahab, his father, that the Lord laid this burden upon him. That's pretty, that's pretty interesting, isn't it? That that came to his mind. Oh, wait, I remember the prophecy that said that. Verse 26, Surely I saw yesterday the blood of Naboth and the blood of his sons, says the Lord. And I will repay you in this plot, this plot of land. I'll repay you for your wickedness in this plot of land, says the Lord. Now, therefore, take him on the plot of ground according to... To the word of the Lord. Verse 27. But when Ahaziah king of Judah saw this, he fled by the road of Beth Hagan. So Jehu pursued him and said, Shoot him also in the chariot. And they shot him at the ascent of Gur, which is by Liblium. Then he fled to Megiddo and died there. And we're going to actually get this in more detail when we get to 2 Chronicles 22. Verse 28. Then his servants carried him and the chariot to Jerusalem and buried him in his tomb, uh, that's Ahaziah, with his fathers in the city of David. In the eleventh year of Joram, the son of Ahab, Ahaziah had become king over Judah. Verse 30. Now when Jehu had come to Jezreel, uh, Jezebel heard of it. Well, I, I think of course. I think I think there's people now that have gone and told Jezebel, uh, your son's dead, shot through the heart. Jehu said that, uh, that he's king. Uh, your, uh, he would have been like a, uh, Ahaziah would have been like a uh, you know, like a grandson-in-law, <laughs> Ahab's grandson. Uh, so he would have been like a grandson-in-law to her, if I'm thinking correctly here. And so she knows the whole story of what's happening. So it's kind of interesting. So I want you to picture Jezebel's been on top of the world now for years, and she's ruled the roost. And even when Ahab, that terrible king, it seemed like she wore the pants in the family. So she she's a tough cookie. Uh, now, when Jehu had come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she put paint on her eyes and adorned her head and looked through a window. This is kind of interesting, isn't it? Um, you, know, you know, in our society, uh, when a woman gets, uh, you know, made up, we, we say she got made up or dressed to the nines or... You know, she put on her makeup or cosmetics or she put on some blush. But when the Bible talks about it, it says she put on paint. <laughs> I'm just saying that's what the Bible says. And I think of the words of J. Vernon McGee, who when he was asked about makeup said, if the paint needs Barney, if the, if the Barney painted. <laughs> <laughs> if the Barney's paint painted. Okay, there we go. But I, I, I'm thinking, I don't know. It, it, in my mind, I'm thinking, she's a hard, proud woman. And, and I think if she's going to go out, she's going to go out looking good, I guess. Or perhaps... Uh, she maybe thinks that she can talk her way out of this or look her way out of this. She's going to try to work it. She's going to try to work a very regal or whatever, you know. That sounds, that makes sense to me. Then as Jehu entered the gate, he, uh, she said, so she's looking out the window of this palace. Who knows how many floors up? Let's just say several floors up. She pokes out there and she says, is it peace, Zimri? murderer of your master <laughs> see now that's the part where I think that she's just super proud she doesn't call him by his own name Jehu she calls him Zimri that's the man who assassinated King Bashan 
So this is almost like somebody saying to the you Benedict Arnold kind of a thing. And he looked up at the window and said, who is on my side? Who? So he's shouting into the palace, hoping that somebody that, that, that recognizes that he's about to take over and he's king will respond to him. And look what happens. Who's on my side? So two or three eunuchs looked out at him. Hello. <laughs> we're, we're on your side. Now look, these guys would have been Jezebel's closest companions. They would have dressed her. They would take care of her. They would have painted her. <laughs> these are the most trusted men in the kingdom. And here, two, two or three of them stepped to the window, and uh, then he said, throw her down. So they threw her down. <laughs> and some of her blood splattered on the wall. I think she hit something on the way down. And on the horses. And he trampled her underfoot, so Jay, you thought, well, I'll just run her over a few times. <laughs> Verse 3, there goes the page. <laughs> You're right. Verse 34, and when he had gone in and ate and drank, so apparently this doesn't bother him at all. He's like, what's to eat? And he said, so after he's kicked back, he says, oh, yeah, wait, I remember I ran that gal over. Uh, go now. See to this accursed woman and bury her, for she was a king's daughter. And, you know, after all, she was royalty, I guess. Verse 35, so they went to bury her, but they found no more of her than the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. She's gone. Verse 36, therefore, they came back and told him, and he said... Oh, yeah, this is the word of the Lord, mm -hmm. which he spoke by the servant Elijah, the Tishbite, saying, On the plot of ground at Jezreel, dog shall eat the flesh of Jezebel. You know, every single bit of God's word is going to come true. Yes. Amen. If somebody was smart, particularly like the United Nations, <laughs> they would take a look at what Ezekiel had to say. And they take a look at what it says in the book of Revelation, and they would go, oh, this is absolutely, unequivocally going to happen. We need to repent. And the corpse of Jezebel shall be as refuse on the surface of the field in the plot of Jezreel, so that they shall not say here lies Jezebel so there's no plot of ground for Jezebel is that an amazing chapter or what and I'm telling you I guess there's no other way to put it but next week more heads will roll <laughs> literally isn't it it could be huh yeah now again because God is slow to anger and slow to judgment. It does not mean that he will not judge. He will judge. It will be complete and it will be to the full. So why does God do that? Why does he do it that way? And here's why. Because he is waiting for people to turn and live. And may I say to each one of us in this room, and I include myself in this, Aren't you glad that God waited for you? Amen. Aren't you glad that God gave you another day in which to repent? Proverbs 29, verse 1 says, and I know Pastor Mike, you particularly like the Proverbs. <laughs> Proverbs 29, 1. He who is often rebuked and hardens his neck will suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. So there is a point where God gives somebody up, and he stops wrestling with them. 
and he and he allows them to harden their heart. Whew. Scary, <laughs> heavy thought. But look, God, even the scriptures we have, God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Only that they would repent. And look, even for us Christians, repentance isn't a one-time event. I find that the longer I walk with God, the more I repent. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean by that? It's just like this continual, you know? Because we love the Lord, we know what He's done, and we want to stay close to Him. So we're always going, oh Lord, forgive me. The Lord goes, I forgive you. He's, he's faithful and just. He just blows my mind. And He doesn't stop calling you His own. Just like we saw here. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank You so much for this night, and I thank You for my brothers and sisters that You brought here to this place, Lord, to hear Your Word. And Lord, that, that that's just a hard chapter. And, uh, Help us, Lord, to see it in the whole context and to realize that you are sovereign and that it's your government that's going to rule and reign on this earth and not the government of men. So, Father, even now, for the things that we should be repenting over, Lord, I, I'll start. Uh, Lord, I repent for my sins. I ask that you forgive me. I ask that you to help me, Lord, to serve you each and every day of my life with all my strength, Lord like an athlete who wants to cross the finish line and win the prize. And I pray that for my brothers and sisters, Lord God, that your forgiveness and mercy and grace would be in this place, Lord, even now. We repent, Lord God. We want to love you and know you and serve you and walk with you continually. Thank you for your word. We pray these things in Jesus' name and everybody says. Amen. Let's stand up as we close in worship.